how much trouble would you want there not to be? It's a weird question, right? Because you want to have something to contend with. You want to have something that, that forces from you the best that you have. And so you have to have real problems, it's something like that. Would you dispense with all your real, you could just lay down on a bed and have pablum infused into your mouth, you know, if all your problems were solved. And so maybe you want difficult problems that you can solve, something like that, because there's some, I don't know what it is about it. There's a, there's the overcoming and the, and the growth that comes along with that. There's something about the nobility of the enterprise. You certainly see that when you go about having children, for example, which is, you know, the psychological literature is quite clear. If you do moment to moment comparisons of people who have kids and people who don't have kids, the people who don't have kids are happier. And so psychologists who tend to get things wrong, even when they make intelligent discoveries like that one, immediately, some of them jump to the conclusion that because happiness is the goal that, well, there's something about children that you know, make you unhappy and that's not good. It's like, well, wait a second. And maybe that's the wrong metric. It's like, of course you're less happy once you have children because you have to worry about them. You know, my neighbor down the street, who's a very smart woman, said to me once, you can only be as happy as your unhappiest child. And which I thought was really good, you know, that's really smart. But then it isn't, well, if having children doesn't make you happy, the answer isn't don't have children. It's like, don't be so stupid about being happy. That's the answer. It's because there's a nobility in the pursuit, right? And of course, now you're responsible. You know, when you have a new baby, you think, especially if you're a new parent, you think, what the hell is this? And what am I going to do with it? You know, it's like, and, and then you're, you're done for the rest of your life. You never sleep properly again because you're going to be worried about this creature that you have to take care of. And, but like, what the hell good are you if you're not doing that or something else equally difficult? Because you just, you just haven't been called out yet unless you take on a responsibility like that. The idea that life is, you know, that happiness is the purpose of life. It's like great for happiness, man. If it comes along, you should be thrilled that it's visiting you. But the notion that that's, that that's what you should pursue, that's, that's the weakest possible notion. First of all, as soon as something terrible happens to you, you're done. It's like, life is to be happy. It's like, well, now you have cancer. So how's that? How's the happiness thing working out for you now? Or maybe it's not you, you know? Maybe it's your father that has Alzheimer's disease or some damn thing. And, you know, it's like it's a rare person that doesn't have some catastrophe one one person away from them. It's like life is to be happy. It's, that's not right. And, and we can at least derive that from these stories. That isn't what they say at all. God's perfectly happy in the stories to grant the people with whom he forms a covenant happiness and prosperity. But there's never a word that that's the purpose. The, the rule is aim high and get your bloody act together. That's the rule and establish this contractual covenant with the ultimate ideal. And that will see you through the catastrophes. And that's a much more mature way of looking at life, as far as I'm concerned, because all you have to do is have your eyes half open and you see that the fundamental reality of life is tragedy and suffering. There's, that's inescapable. The, the quest, that doesn't mean that it, it makes life unbearable or that it makes being something that shouldn't have existed. Right? That isn't what it means, but it means that you have to contend with it and you have to get ready. And the willingness to adopt responsibility for yourself and for others is is the precondition for that. And, and then maybe if you do that properly, then now and then you get some happiness. You know, you can sit at the end of the day and you have half an hour where your conscience is clear and there's nothing that you need to be doing and you can relax and think, you know, that's all right, things are okay. And thank God for that. And that's, that's maybe where you get your happiness. So. It's sort of predicated on the idea that life is for happiness. And I don't think that's right. And I don't think that's how people experience life. And I might be wrong, but it seems to me that people experience life as something like a, a series of crucial ethical decisions. It's something like that. I mean, when I, I just can't imagine, maybe I'm being naive about this, but I can't imagine that, I can't imagine another being that's like me in, in, in most senses, that isn't constantly wrestling in some sense with what the next proper thing to do is. It's not like it's obvious. It's not bloody obvious. And it, it doesn't mean you'll do the right thing, because you don't lot, lots of times. And you know that 
by your own judgment, right? Because you're making mistakes all the time. Sometimes you don't know what you're doing, and maybe it's a mistake, and maybe it isn't. And who's to say? That isn't what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when you know that what you're doing is wrong, and you go ahead and do it anyways. People do that all the time. And that's also extremely peculiar. You bloody well think that if you knew it was wrong, and you told yourself that it was wrong, that that would be sufficient, so that you just wouldn't do it. But that isn't what you're like at all, you know. And you can tell yourself something is wrong 50 times, and you'll do it the 51st time, and then you'll feel, you know, like, like you deserve to feel, probably. And, but it doesn't stop you. And so, so then I think the other problem with the, the viewpoint, the idea that the suffering of life eradicates its utility is that it's predicated on the idea that happiness or lack of suffering even is, is the right criteria by which to judge life. And I don't think that's how we actually experience life. I think what we do instead is put ourselves through a series of excruciating moral choices. You know, and one of the things that, that's really significant about the biblical stories, and I, I think about the, the entire implicit philosophy, you know, that's embedded in the stories, is that that's how life is presented in, in the stories, is all of these individuals, first they're individuals, not groups, and second, they're agonizing over their moral choices all the time, all the time. And they have a relationship with God, and, but it's not, a, it's not a directive relationship exactly. Even the people to whom God speaks directly, which I suspect is not something you'd exactly want to have happen, is, it, it, it's, they're still, the, even the fact that they have a direct relationship with God doesn't stop them from being tormented continually by their moral choices. And so the world is presented as a, a moral landscape, not as a, not as a place that justifies itself by happiness. It's presented as a moral landscape, and people are presented as creatures who traverse through the moral landscape, making ethical decisions that determine the course of the world. And that seems to me to be right, and that's not, a, that's not the same as happiness by any stretch of the imagination. It's a whole different category of being. And, you know, and then I've thought that through a lot, and I think, well, we do make choices, and what we do is contend with the future, you know? And the future seems to appear to us as a realm of possibility. That's a more accurate way of thinking about it than, than that the future presents itself to, it, to us as a realm of determined things. It it's presents itself as a realm of possibility, and there's good choices in that realm, and there's poor choices, or even evil choices in that realm. And we're negotiating continually deciding which of those choices we're going to bring into being, that seems to me to be phenomenologically indisputable, and we certainly treat each other as if that's what we're doing, because we hold each other responsible for our actions, you know, with some exceptions, and that we're deciding each moment whether to make things better or worse. There's a profound anti-human ethos, I think, that pervades our culture, you know, that considers human beings cancers on the planet, something like that, you know, and that there should be less of us. It's the same spirit that motivated the guy who wrote the book about the better you have never been. And it's like, I don't see it that way, you know, I mean, I think people do pretty well for, you know, for having their leg caught in a bear trap and their head caught in a vice, they're actually doing pretty well, because life is really hard, and the fact that we're not absolutely brutal and murderous all the time is really something remarkable, given what we actually have to contend with, that we can go out of our way to be honest and generous and altruistic and to care for each other under unbelievably dire circumstances and to act nobly sometimes under the most trying conditions. You know, Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago tells story after story of people who acted abysmally, but also people who, under the worst threats imaginable, never sacrificed their character. You know, and reading about that is really well, it really makes you wonder. That's, that's what it does.